Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, first of all, good afternoon. Welcome to this last uh, lecture uh, today. Uh, so, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be back here at the uh, ICTP, and now some of the thing disappeared. So, uh, I, I switch the computer on. So <clears throat> I got uh, the title for these lectures, BSM Cosmology. And uh, you may wonder what that means. Actually, I didn't know uh, either. So uh, on the other hand, looking at the program and contacting uh, the other speakers, uh, it was clear that there are several talks here, somehow related uh, to this, uh, several lectures related to the same theme, like uh, on dark matter, on axions, and uh, then by Subiasaka, the general introduction uh, to cosmology. So I thought it should somehow complement what you had in the uh, other talks. And so I <clears throat> decided to, uh, in fact, talking to the others, uh, to focus on um, baryogenesis and uh, inflation. Ah, it doesn't work, okay, no problem. That doesn't work either, huh? Yeah, but I, but I mean, it doesn't work. Okay. Now, <clears throat> just to uh, get started, let me start uh, from uh, this picture which uh, is something very similar to what you have seen, I think, already in the lectures of uh, Subesaka. It shows uh, the, uh, say, some picture of uh, the hot phase of the early universe, in fact, a little bit more. And uh, <clears throat> as you know, there is a microwave background, which uh, is sort of the end uh, of the uh, hot Big Bang. And that is something which we know very well and which has been beautifully analyzed now by uh, very satellite uh, experiments, most recently Planck in particular, and so that we know in great detail uh, the microwave background and really understand it. <clears throat> and I think this is the basis then for extrapolating uh, from here to uh, earlier times and then higher temperatures. Because you know here uh, the temperature was not that high, well it was related to the ionization energy of hydrogen, so the temperature was about uh, um, say 10 uh, electron volts, 1,000 Kelvin. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, something we can be certain about. But then the question is, how do we go on? Now, we can go on in this direction theoretically because we know uh, the structure of matter beyond atomic physics. There's nuclear physics. There is uh, the standard model, weak interactions, electronic phase transition, and maybe eventually grand unification. And the question is, how far can we extrapolate? And that is, uh, for that, you have to have uh, theoretical bias. So we don't really know. And uh, <clears throat> it is possible, for instance, that baryogenesis takes place here around uh, the electronic phase transition. It is possible that it takes place much earlier, as in the case of leptogenesis, or uh, it is also possible to consider some extreme examples of baryogenesis where it, in fact, takes place at temperatures below the temperature for the electroweak phase transition. So uh, then the question is, what is correct? And I will discuss uh, the two main examples and some more exotic ones in the following. So basically, the question here then is, when and how was uh, the baryonic symmetry generated? And then uh, you see here what uh, we have from the end of the hot Big Bang phase, uh, namely the CMB, there will be eventually something similar also from the beginning, namely gravitational waves. And uh, so the question is, 
it would be beautiful, say, if gravitational waves uh, would be discovered. <clears throat> First of all, indirectly via the CMB. There has been some very important discussions recently. And otherwise, uh, directly by interferometer experiments in the near future. So I think the real hope in this field is that eventually you will also see this and get maybe a picture uh, similar to what we have from here. And uh, then uh, it is generally uh, believed that uh, before that there was a phase of inflation. This is not a theorem, and I think one can still doubt whether or not this is true. On the other hand, there is no really serious uh, candidate to this. And so the question is really what was the scale uh, at which inflation took place, and then who is the inflaton? What really caused inflation, and how does it fit into extensions of the standard model? And then there is an important question, which I, I'll come back to that from time to time, but um, I don't really have, cannot discuss it in too much detail, and that is how these things, inflation, baryogenesis, dark matter, are related. And the reason is that if you just take these things by itself, there's very little quantitative information. And so it's very difficult to make progress unless you uh, treat these different things as pieces uh, of one puzzle, which you try to uh, put together. So then here's the outline of these lectures. <clears throat> I will split the thing roughly 50-50 into baryogenesis. And here I'll spend first some time electronic baryogenesis and leptogenesis, and then a brief discussion of other models, and then move on to inflation. And uh, here, first discuss the basic picture. Very elementary, still for those who uh, maybe are not so familiar with that. And then discuss some recent developments, particularly related to the new data from Planck and BICEP, the question whether inflation is large field inflation or small field inflation, how you connect it to reheating and possibly to dark matter. So this is the outline. So let's then start with baryogenesis. <clears throat> So baryogenesis uh, is a question of what is uh, the origin of this one number, the ratio of baryons in the universe and the number of photons. Now, you know, that is a very small number. The number of photons is about 400 per cubic centimeter. And so the number of baryons averaged over the universe is, say, nine orders of magnitude smaller than that. It is now with a remarkable accuracy of about 5% that's been measured by uh, Planck. And uh, so the question is, what is this? And this is somehow, uh, in some sense, baryogenesis is a very strange topic because it's just one number. And if you think how many papers have been written about this one number during uh, now well, I would say mostly the last uh, 30 years. It is amazing, and we are still not uh, sure what it is, so you still have a chance to find yourself, uh, say, the right uh, answer. In fact, uh, as everybody knows, uh, the first uh, <clears throat> paper on that was written uh, by Saharov. There's almost 50, uh, 50th anniversary of this, and then uh, I listed a few other papers, Actually, what I try here with references is the following. I will, for each of the sections, list a few references, which I think are sort of the key in the sense, not necessarily it's a difficult decision what to pick, but uh, something which you should read if you really want to work on that and want to understand it better. And then I will give in the other topics, uh, for the other topics, also some reviews. Now, here's the first paper is Sakharov. The second is the connection baryon lepton number by Toft. Then what happens with that at high temperatures, Kuzmin, Rubakov, Shaposhnikov. And then an important one also for all the quantitative studies, how chemical potentials are related in a high temperature phase. Subia Saka has already discussed some of that, but we will need a little more. So let's then come to these conditions. I think you must have seen them. All of you must have seen those. Uh, necessary conditions for a matter and time matter asymmetry. You clearly need barrier number violation. If you don't have that, you cannot generate an asymmetry. You also need CNCP violation. Otherwise, uh, you also cannot have a barrier asymmetry. That's pretty obvious. Uh, more tricky is a, a departure from thermal deviation. Actually, I should say these are necessary conditions. They are not sufficient. 
in the sense that if you if uh, sufficient conditions, it's much more difficult to formulate. Of course, the question is, uh, is then what you get by doing the calculations, do you get enough baryon asymmetry? And this is not at all a trivial and very often an interplay, a tricky interplay of uh, various pieces, and we will see some examples of that. Now, uh, maybe the most tricky thing, which in fact was even wrongly treated in, the first, in some of the very early papers on uh, baryogenesis, is this third condition. And let us just check that if it's not fulfilled, you will never have a baryon asymmetry. That you can uh, easily do. You take, say, suppose we have just thermal equilibrium. Then if I have any observable, like the baryon number density, then uh, that observable is given by sort of the, 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 the trace of uh, e to the beta h. h is the Hamiltonian of the theory. Beta is one over the temperature times the baryon number, and then I have to take the trace uh, of this. So this describes the system, and this is the operator <coughs> which uh, measures, or which is the operator, the observable, corresponding to baryon number. Then you can insert here a 1, which you write as theta, theta to the minus 1, but this is the CPT operator, and then you use the trace property, put that on the other side, and you know uh, that CPT uh, is something which commutes with the Hamiltonian, so you can put this through, and then uh, since the baryon operator is odd under CPT, you get uh, that this is minus to itself, so in thermal equilibrium, it's zero. <coughs> so you need uh, a departure from thermal equilibrium to explain a baryon asymmetry, and how is that realized, that is realized, is in fact very different in the different examples. <coughs> Actually, I should say, uh, what is said here uh, is true under the condition that you generate a baryon asymmetry sort of from a thermal bath. There are other ways, which in the end may be true, uh, that is in fact different, that the baryon <coughs> asymmetry is generated in a different way related to the dynamics of scalar field. A well-known example, which I will not have time really to discuss, is affleck dyn baryogenesis. There are many papers on the decay of heavy moduli fields, which you may get in string theory, uh, which also have lots of problems. But in principle, there's also a possibility, and so on. So there are other, there's cold baryogenesis, which you do after. There are many things. Which uh, So uh, these conditions are uh, relevant only for a certain class of models. So let me then discuss uh, baryon and lepton uh, in this number in the standard model. As you know, in the standard model, you have currents for baryon number. It's just the sum of the currents for left-handed and uh, quarks and the right-handed up and down quark. And similarly, for the leptons, you have the lepton doublet and the uh, uh, electron. Now, what is very important is that uh, the divergence of these currents is not zero. <coughs> You know, for a conserved quantity, the divergence of the current has to be zero. Here, the divergence is given by this uh, anomaly. In fact, in a somewhat fancy, for those of you who are more mathematically uh, uh, inclined, uh, this is, say, the derivative of a churn simons form, which we will see on the next slide. So um, it is something which is the total divergence. And if we would not have a non abelian gauge theory, then we wouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, then uh, that would be irrelevant, so for QED. But here, for SU2, for uh, the electroweak theory, we do have to worry about this. And these are uh, the fields, the W fields, and uh, the U1 field uh, in the standard model. Now, uh, if you <coughs> now know that you have this divergence, then you can use that and takes the integral over all space and over a finite time interval from an initial to a final time. And then uh, what you find is that this is proportional to the number of generations which you have in the standard model, which here is three, and then you have a difference of uh, something called Schoen simons number, which is this integral, which you just get from calculating the anomaly. And now this thing uh, uh, has a uh, important feature that the jump uh, is always an integer. That's uh, this topological nature. And um, so the num this thing here, this difference, as you go from some initial time to some final time, can jump 
by units by plus minus one, plus minus two, and so on. And so in field space, that means if you say generically, say it takes a W field space in this direction, then uh, there is a, in this field space as a potential. And this potential uh, has degenerate points which differ by integers of this uh, Chern Simons number, and there's an energy barrier associated with that, and that energy barrier is the energy of the object, so called Sphaleron object. Now, um, this is uh, what is important. Those who know QCD, uh, I'm sure they know that, the theta parameter and everything associated uh, with that. You have uh, here, you have a tunneling between those vacua, uh, and the tunneling amplitude is given by instantons. So that gives you uh, this. And then if you look at this instanton, and then you somehow contained in that, uh, you have uh, the Sphaleron. And the Sphaleron you can also find as a saddle point of uh, the electroweak um, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, <clears throat> which has the interesting property if you have this, it's a saddle point with just one negative eigenvalue. And this one negative eigenvalue then gives you uh, uh, the Sphaleron decay rate. Anyway, this uh, just uh, to this. And what you now get from this is that uh, these instanton interactions, or at finite temperature, usually called Sphaleron interactions, they generate uh, an effective interaction between all the left-handed fermions in the theory. So <clears throat> that's a very democratic interaction. You have 12 left-handed fermions in the standard ball, starting from the left-handed up quark uh, up to, uh, say, the tau neutrino. Here, you have to make sure that the arrows all go uh, in the same direction. And in fact, this interaction uh, describes, uh, is described by these operators. The sum here, i, goes from 1 to 3. And it gives you an effective interaction of all the fermions in the standard model. Now, this changes baryon and lepton number uh, by 3, violates lepton and num uh, baryon number by 3. So that means that uh, given the fact that you have this vertex, you can, uh, this instanton interactions in the standard model or at finite temperature, these Sphaleron processes, make all processes possible uh, which you get from this vertex. So for example, you can take uh, three of those lines, revert the arrow, and take it as an incoming, uh, as an out, say, an incoming state in this case, and then the rest as outgoing. So you can have these three uh, right-handed antiquark. So if you start from a left-handed quark, you take uh, the antiparticle, you get a right-handed antiquark, goes into this bunch. These three go into these nine left-handed fermions. Now you may think that's a very complicated process. Still, it's possible. Well, I make a few comments. Uh, still, it's possible in principle to calculate that. And uh, it's a very interesting process. In fact, uh, there have also been, or there are still discussions of how to search for such things also, not just at high temperature, but at high energy. And there are some uh, interesting papers investigating the possibility that it may be possible, say, at a larger Hadron Collider, like a 100 TV Collider, to see something like that. Anyway, now uh, the rate for such processes depends crucially on temperature. Now, uh, what Toft, first, Toft uh, in 76 first pointed out that such processes exist at all, and then at zero temperature he made an estimate. Uh, this rate here has an instant on factor, which is about 10 to the minus 165. So from that you conclude you don't have to worry about that. So at zero temperature you are safe, and uh, so we don't have to worry about proton decay due to non-perturbative effects in the standard model. But as you now go to high temperatures, the situation changes. When you reach temperatures of the order uh, of the electroweak phase transition, then you get a, this Phaleron energy, which I showed you, which uh, is proportional to the temperature-dependent expectation value of the Higgs field. And that gives you this exponentially 
a suppressed rate with a certain prefactor. So that's the rate for B plus L violation per uh, volume. And if you now really go above this electroweak phase transition to high temperatures, then this approaches a certain constant. Uh, this is the, the weak uh, coupling constant at um, the critical temperature of this electroweak phase transition. You have the fourth power of the temperature for dimensional reasons. And this is a number which, in fact, has been calculated on the lattice. Uh, it's about 20 plus or minus 2. That, for us, is not so important. What is important there is that the uh, product altogether is about 10 to the minus 6. Now, <clears throat> actually, there's a, lots of interesting stories related to this number, how to calculate. It's sort of a beautiful topic in quantum field theory, which, however, is not the topic of this lecture. Now, um, based on this stuff, there is a consensus among theorists that B plus L violating processes are in thermal equilibrium in a certain temperature range. Um, between, say, roughly 100 GeV for the electroweak phase transition up to about 10 to the 12. If you go to even higher temperatures, then due to this power here, uh, these uh, Svalon processes get, I mean, you, you have to, that you learned, I hope, in the lecture by uh, Subir, Saka, that uh, what is very important for all processes is to always ask yourself, in the history of the early universe, is this process in thermal equilibrium or not? And in order to check that, what you have to do is to calculate the rate and to compare it uh, to the Hubble parameter. And, you know, the Hubble parameter has a temperature dependence which is, um, goes like, at high temperatures, like T squared. And you see uh, this goes like T to the fourth. So once you have different temperature dependencies, then, uh, which you always have for various processes, then these processes at some time are in equilibrium, at some other time are not in equilibrium. So I say uh, there is a consensus among the theorists, which means that nobody questions this. On the other hand, working in this field, I must say I sometimes worry about the fact that we have no experimental evidence for this. We have it neither for these electroweak instantons, nor do we have it really for QCD instantons. So uh, there were some recent discussions whether or not one could check this in heavy ion collisions, the corresponding QCD effects, but uh, otherwise there is no direct experimental evidence. And if you have some idea how to check, say this, for instance, in QCD, it will be wonderful. I think it's still a very important problem. Now let me come to the third ingredient which we need for uh, baryogenesis, which are these chemical potentials. This is in principle an exercise which you can do in uh, the first course on thermodynamics. You have a certain number of particles. You can associate chemical potentials to them. They have reactions. These reactions give you relations between uh, the chemical potentials, and then uh, you can solve that and see what the implications are. Now, let's look at the standard model. We have one Higgs doublet, and we have NF generations. NF, of course, is three. However, I keep it as a free uh, parameter in order uh, to be able to uh, get some formulae which, where I can, which are more transparent. Then, I think what you saw in the lecture by Subesaka is that if you now look at the number density of particle and antiparticle, then you have this characteristic factor where G is the number of internal degrees of freedom. And then you have uh, this, uh, this chemical potential divided by temperature. So that means the chemical potential tells you how big the difference between particle number and antiparticle number density is. Fact is different by a factor of two for fermions and bosons. Now, let's look at the standard model. Then first, you have these uh, SU2 instantons, which is the Svalon process. From that, you get the relation because you have uh, um, the, that uh, three times the number of chemical potentials from the quark. You get the factor of three here because you have three colors, plus the number of lepton chemical potentials is zero. Then you have QCD instantons also, and that relates just the quarks and gives you this relation. Yeah, G, uh, G is the number of internal degrees of freedom. So G, excuse me? 
of what? Of this particular particle. For instance, if you take a, if you take a photon, which we don't have here, then uh, G uh, would be two, because you have uh, two helicity states. If you take, say, um, uh, an electron, a left-handed electron, then uh, you would have uh, G for, uh, would be two. Because with this field, you associate the left-handed electron and the right-handed uh, anti-electron, and so on. So you can do that. Uh, so that is a counting which you have to include in uh, all these um, which you um, have to include here for all these number densities. And uh, then you get uh, yeah. I was just wondering why do the sum of all these chemical potentials need to vanish? I'm not clear on that. You are not clear on that. Well, uh, okay, you can either do a, a calculation for that, or you can, if you just want an intuitive argument, if you look at uh, if you look at this process, then um, if such reactions here take place uh, very quickly, then that means that if you have, say, an asymmetry in this, so this would be a left-handed uh, muon neutrino. If you have uh, <clears throat> a difference between this and its antiparticle, then by such a process, this would equ equilibrate uh, and so suppose you start from a state where you have an asymmetry here and no asymmetry in all the other particles. Then due to these interactions, this asymmetry would get distributed uh, around everybody because these processes take place. Is that roughly clear? Or suppose you start from asymmetry. That's a very important point. Uh, or suppose you start from asymmetry in this. Then this distributes among all the other degrees of freedom. Yeah, maybe you should do a little exercise for this. Uh, but uh, that's, that's a very important point. In fact, the whole baryogenesis always works like that. I mean, you start, <clears throat> for instance, in electroweak baryogenesis, you generate an asymmetry, say, maybe first starting with the top quark. And then that gets, get this, gets distributed by this uh, thing, uh, the asymmetry in the left-handed top quark of all degrees of freedom. In leptogenesis, you start from uh, an asymmetry in these uh, neutrinos and uh, a leptode asymmetry which you generate from uh, heavy Majorana neutrino decays. And that um, then also gets distributed over all the degrees of freedom. Yeah? And why are the downside quarks twice? Because I think that's... Uh, probably a typo. No, no, each. Ah, no, 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 sorry. Uh, no, no. Uh, this is just one example. Of course, you have to, um, uh, no, no, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you, uh, each color counts. So, so for example, uh, you have to, um, from these states, you have to form a color singlet, okay? Here, I just wrote this product. If you write that out, you need epsilon tensors, which connect the indices in color and in SU2, because the whole operator has to be a singlet. So uh, that means these are two down quarks with different uh, color, and then you have still an up quark with yet another color, so that this forms a singlet. The same is true uh, for the others, okay? So really have so one possibility is that you have two down quarks. Another is you may have two up quarks and so on. Just it has to be the total thing has to be color neutral. I just wrote this generically and not explicitly with the indices. Okay. There are a few other questions up here before you go on. So I just had another question that's 
I'm still not clear exactly what this phaleron is. Is it um, tunneling at a non-zero or a non-vacuum energy so, level, I mean, or is the, it an instability at that local maximum? Yeah, that you're I mean, this phaleron is <clears throat> technically uh, you take, say, you take the um, uh, the uh, SU2 part of the standard model Lagrange involving, let's switch off the hypercharge coupling, so then we have just the W bosons and the Higgs doublet, okay? And then uh, you neglect, say, uh, the dependence on the time coordinate, so you have a three-dimensional theory. And then you can take this and look for a stationary point. And then you find one, and this is the Svada one. So in principle, and uh, so this object then has also a certain energy density, or certain energy, and that's the Svalaron energy. Now, um, you can look, if you take now your full uh, Lagrange, you can now look for fluctuations around this, and, and then you find that this is not a stable, it's not a stable uh, extremum, but there is one direction in field space where uh, the mass squared sort of is negative. You have negative curvature. And then I think Svaleron, it's a, I think it's a Greek name, which uh, means uh, essentially, well, we should have some Greek here who explains it to us. Uh, it's about to decay, something like this. So I think this one negative eigenvalue is a crucial quantity. Okay. Uh, so when you make the statement that uh, in standard model, baryon and lepton number are violated, do you mean that the standard model of particle physics with only diamonds and four terms? Sorry? I mean, when you, when you uh, say that the standard model violates uh, baryon and lepton number symmetry, uh, via loop correction or anomalous. So you you mean that in, in stand, this is the standard model of particle physics with only terms up to dimension four. I mean you you do not add dimension five or higher dimension terms, and you still get baryon and lepton number violation. It's just the standard model with just with renormalizable couplings. Yeah. Then I have this confusion. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, we know that uh, standard model has 19 parameters, I mean 18 usual parameters plus the strong CP parameter. And uh, a CKM matrix has only one phase. I mean, I have always this confusion. So uh, when removing the uh, unphysical phases of the CKM matrix, we use baryon and lepton number symmetry as a part of it. Now, if you say that, that this baryon and lepton number are violated, so I can write the full Lagrangian of the standard model, including all these corrections, then uh, since baryon and lepton number symmetry are no longer a symmetry of the full Lagrangian, then we cannot use that symmetry to remove unphysical phases of the CKM matrix. Then there will be at least one extra phase that, is, that will enter in your analysis. So, no, I, Actually, there's a trick which I cannot now not prove on the blackboard. But for instance, there's a difference between, um, I mean, the question is whether you can, this anomaly. I mean, if that violates baryon and lepton number, you, can, you will have one additional phase then that, that we have not seen again in the, in the CKM. Yeah, no, I don't, no, no, I think that phase is not there. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's true. I mean, you have to worry about the fact that, uh, well, first of all, these effects will, at zero temperature will be negligible. But of course, another question is very conceptually. Uh, yeah, I mean, should I, should I make this statement that standard model of particle physics has more than 19 parameters? I mean, I don't, that's... I don't, that's I don't, I don't think so. I mean, the, that question is, has been discussed in the following sense. Um, there is a, another anomaly uh, the related to uh, a chiral symmetry in QCD, which there relates uh, uh, to the so-called theta parameter. And the question is whether there's a similar parameter uh, which you would have to count for the weak electroweak theory. That would be the, this additional parameter. But the statement is uh, that parameter is not there. Now, uh, you, it's unphysical. I cannot give you now the proof, but we can talk about it. Yes, okay. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm happy that you asked this question, so I hope we learn something together. On the other hand, I also uh, have to make some progress. Otherwise, we will never make it to...
Yeah. I'm sorry, I just yeah. have one more quick question yes. about the Svalorons. So is it correct that they uh, act only on the left-handed fields yes. because yeah. it corresponds to the SU2 left exactly. symmetry? Yeah. So yeah. once SU2 left is broken, do also the Svalorons disappear then? Well, they become irrelevant, yeah. That means uh, the rate of these, um, the rate of these um, transition uh, becomes zero. Mm -hmm. It gets exponentially suppressed. Okay, and then why don't we have swallowrons, let's say, for SU3? That, that's also non abelian. Well, you have, uh, uh, you have, um, you have instantons for SU3 also. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, you have similar processes, but uh, I don't. Uh, discuss them here because they are not important for uh, the barrier number. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, you can uh, see that here, for instance, in this uh, relation for the chemical potentials, you have, um, here you have the Svalaron effect, or the SU2 instantons, which give you this relation among chemical potentials, and correspondingly, uh, you have a, uh, such a relation also in QCD. So in principle, you have a similar effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, there are more relations uh, here, which maybe I, I uh, skip now. Uh, you get uh, some rule for, which has, is related to the fact that the total uh, hypercharge of uh, your state should be zero. The state should be neutral with respect to hypercharge. And um, <clears throat> it is clear if you have in the different particle species asymmetries, and if they don't satisfy a certain relation, then since all these species have different hypercharges, the total hypercharge would not add up uh, to zero. So that you have to satisfy, and that gives you uh, this relation. <clears throat> then there, is an important, there are important relations also uh, like this. So uh, reactions like this you get from, Yuka uh, relations like this you get from Yukawa interactions. So for instance, uh, Say, suppose you have a, a left-handed U quark which interacts uh, with a Higgs and uh, turns into a right-handed uh, U quark. And then uh, you, you also have uh, to make it a proper reaction, say, you have a gauge boson here. So now for the gauge bosons, they are neutral, uh, so the uh, chemical potential is zero, and um, then that relates uh, these three uh, chemical potential, and it gives you uh, this uh, cubic relations. Now, there is a tricky point here. What we shall assume uh, in most of the stuff, essentially in all, all the stuff which I will discuss, is that these Yukawa interactions are <clears throat> in thermal equilibrium. And uh, that is not true, actually. And the way you can check that is the following. Clearly, uh, these uh, reactions here are uh, proportional to this Yukawa coupling. And for some uh, particles, this Yukawa coupling is very small, like uh, for the up quark or for the electron. And then uh, the rate, the corresponding transition rate, they are proportional to the temperature. And they are out of equilibrium if you compare that with other processes for a very, very long time. For instance, this Yukawa interaction for the electron, if I remember correctly, comes into thermal equilibrium only at a temperature of about uh, a TeV. So these are, in the very early universe, these particles are decoupled. And that can mean that uh, there are other ways of baryogenesis in the end also. In fact, such models have been discussed in the literature uh, which don't follow these rules, where, say, for some reason, you generate an asymmetry in one of these species which is decoupled in the beginning, which then later, when this guy comes into thermal equilibrium, by the Svalhorn process, get distributed over all the other degrees of freedom. Anyway, this is just a caveat. If you uh, now believe those relations, then you can solve them. You can define a total barrier number and a lepton number like this in terms of the chemical potentials. And you find a remarkable relation, namely that both baryon number and lepton number are proportional to the difference of baryon and lepton number. 
with numbers here. This yes, the standard model is about one third. And uh, the important thing here is that they are both proportional to this difference. So the Svalaron processes, they conserve the difference of baryon and lepton number, but they violate the sum. And uh, <clears throat> for instance, that already shows you that there is a fundamental difference between electroweak baryogenesis and leptogenesis. In electroweak uh, baryogenesis, um, if you are just stick to the standard model, B minus L is always conserved, so B minus L will always be zero. Still, by a, a very tricky uh, non-perturbative interaction, you, which has to do with bubble nucleation, you can uh, uh, nevertheless generate a baryon asymmetry. Whereas in lepton, leptogenesis, the story is completely different. At the very, in the very early universe, you have a decay of right-handed neutrinos that generates an asymmetry in B minus L, and this asymmetry in B minus L is then no longer uh, further uh, affected and gives you the B minus L asymmetry today. So, now to electroweak biogenesis, the first uh, topic. Now, <clears throat> electroweak biogenesis, I gave two references here. One, uh, in fact, the thermal field theory phase transition started with Weinberg and uh, Dolan and Shakif. But I think first this paper by Kirschnitz and Lind on the abelian Higgs model contains essentially all the ingredients which you need to understand the properties of the phase transition. So therefore, this is certainly one of the key papers. And then there are many papers on the mechanism of how you then really dynamically generate the asymmetry. One which is closest, I think, to the picture which one has today is this by Cohen, Kaplan, and Nelson. I also listed some reviews. Here you find some interesting conceptual discussions. Morisset and uh, Ramsey Musolf, they uh, have uh, also a number of uh, very uh, thorough discussion with emphasis on supersymmetry. And here you can find in this report by Constantine, you can find the discussion for the field theoretic aspects of the non-equilibrium process. Now, what we now need for uh, the baryogenesis <clears throat> or for the phase transition is something like this. And I think you all must have seen a picture like this. This corresponds to a second order phase transition, this to a third order phase transition. So uh, what the expansion of the universe does, it's uh, the following. We have essentially a big thermal bath. And as the universe expands, it cools down. The temperature decreases. So you move, say, from such a temperature down. If the, te the phase transition would be second order, here you would, it would be very smooth, and you would then just here develop an instability. However, if you have a potential like this, then again, at very high temperatures, uh, the minimum of your field value is here. But then, as the temperature decreases, you would reach a point where these points are uh, where you have, say, a broken phase and a symmetric phase, which are essentially degenerate. And then close to that, uh, so here you get, uh, when you cool down, you are stuck, say, here. But then when this moves a little bit below, then uh, you get a first order phase transition as uh, by bubble nucleation, where you tunnel from here to here. Actually, uh, the, whole, oops, the whole calculation of this, if you look into the literature, is quite uh, tricky. And it is tricky even in condensed matter, where the particle from which the particle physicists learned a lot in doing this calculation it goes back originally to a theory by Jim Langer, and which you need if you want to calculate, for instance, how rain happens. Because in rain, also, at some point, uh, you start at high temperature, and then you form bubbles. Now here, what you usually calculate is the formation of one bubble. Okay? Now, of course, rain, you get many, many, many bubbles. And so the process, how you really get this nucleation, the percolation theory associated with that, how these bubbles expand, and how you calculate that, is a complicated process, but quite an interesting uh, topic. Yeah? Yes? It's a run. Yeah. 
Well, how you get this potential, I will now explain in detail. I, how, you, how you get, how you obtain such a potential, I will now explain in detail. Yeah, that's, in fact, an important point. <clears throat> so that's a finite temperature field theory, how you calculate, how to calculate these effective potentials. And uh, what you have to do is then uh, to calculate first these uh, potentials in thermal equilibrium. So in order to set the basics and just to say what one is really calculating without doing that then uh, for the full uh, standard model, <clears throat> let me say how you calculate this finite temperature potential, say, for a massive scalar field. That's the easiest case. And now which you, uh, what you may know from your course in quantum field theory, there is a, a very interesting uh, connection between quantum field theory in Minkowski space and uh, finite temperature theory. First, of course, you know there is uh, uh, the connection. You can make a big quotation. And uh, field theory in Minkowski space is equivalent to uh, Euclidean field theory. If you now, in the Euclidean field theory, take the time interval over finite length from zero to beta, where beta is one over the temperature, then <clears throat> you get uh, uh, statistical mechanics for this uh, in, at a temperature uh, T for this field theory. That's a very important connection. And uh, <clears throat> if you don't know it, I cannot explain it now, but you should look it up when you have uh, some time in your field theory book. Now, uh, so now, so this is, this integral of a beta will then just always uh, denote this. Now, what we do is we introduce to this, add to this, and I take a massive scalar field here, so mu is positive, mu squared. Now, uh, we add a source term, that means a constant source, which is essentially a force which pushes the field away from zero. And uh, then you can calculate this, uh, the free energy of the system, which you get from this generating functional, like uh, f from, the, uh, from this, from the partition function, which is e to the minus beta, again, one of the temperatures, the volume. And then uh, you have the free energy density here, which depends on this source J. And now taking the derivative gives you phi. And phi is now, uh, the meaning of this is that it's really uh, the expectation value of the field operator. Uh, in at a temperature phi. And you have the volume average here. So it's a total average of this field. Now, uh, <clears throat> what you do is, as in classical mechanics, you, um, the, uh, you do a Legendre transform, and you get the free energy now for the system where you specify uh, this average uh, field. So uh, you then get uh, this potential as a function of phi. And if you calculate that, you get first um, uh, the te zero temperature potential, which we saw on the previous slide. Then you get a factor pi minus pi squared over 90 temperature to the fourth. That you should know from statistical mechanics, because if you take just photons, then you have two degrees of bosonic degrees of freedom, and you get here pi squared over 45 times t through the force. So this is just a little check. So this is the free energy. And then you get higher uh, things. You get here this mass term. And uh, so I'm missing here a term t squared. Sorry, t squared is missing. And then you get a cubic, a cubic term in the mass times t, and so on. This is done. Uh, now uh, as an expansion in powers of <clears throat> this mass over the temperature, where this is small, and this mass is this, which is just uh, the second derivative of the potential with respect uh, to phi. This is the potential. So if you differentiate with respect twice with respect to phi, then you get this mass. And you have here, given the mass, you have a simple uh, expression for the scalar field. Now, uh, <clears throat> you can now combine uh, 
these two terms, this is where the T is missing, and the tree level mass term here, and you write this potential as one half m squared, and then you have a term lambda over four t to the fourth, uh, t squared times phi squared plus lambda to the fourth, and so on. And so you get a temperature correction to this mass. So this is a picture of, in the end, if you pursue that, of quasi-particles having a, a temperature-dependent mass. However, you have to be careful with this. This is very a useful quantity for many things. But you also have to be careful for it because in gauge theories, it's not gauge invariant. And you cannot just treat it as a kinematic mass. But this will not be uh, so important for us. Now, uh, <clears throat> let me, uh, now starting with the simplest example, just where I told you what uh, we are just calculating. Now to uh, an example which is more interesting and which essentially contains uh, the essence of uh, the electric phase transition. <clears throat> Actually, uh, as I said, this work by Kirschnitz and Linde started that to a large extent. And a nice discussion of this is also given in this book by Linde, uh, I think, Inflation and Cosmology. Now, uh, let's now go to this abelian Higgs model. Then we have now a scalar field which carries uh, charge. So we have a covariant derivative here. And then uh, we have this thing. And now the crucial point is that this mass squared is negative. And uh, therefore, this field in the ground state acquires a vacuum expectation value. Of course, as you know, one has to be a little bit careful with that. One has to say in which gauge uh, this vacuum expectation value uh, uh, is meant and uh, so on. I will skip that and just tell you that if you do a calculation similar and correctly as to what you do for the real scalar field, then you get now a finer temperature potential, which looks like this. It is t squared minus some constant, which is minus mu squared over some coefficient a, <coughs> which you can, which is given by the coupling constants. Then you have a cubic term, linear in the temperature, and then you have a aquatic term. And uh, these coefficients here, are def you can get them from this full expression by defining uh, this quantity to be the one where the second derivative of the potential at the origin vanishes. And uh, the other uh, coefficient is the one which, well, th that gives you a certain temperature. Now, uh, <clears throat> And it's a barrier temperature, so-called barrier temperature, because there the barrier disappears. So if you look back at this picture, that would be the, temp the temperature where the potential close to the origin here looks like this. So what is here called uh, T1, I now call uh, Tb. So this is how you get the potential. Now, uh, <clears throat> what is fast, even more important, is now this critical temperature. That's the one where um, the potential at this non-zero Higgs value is equal to uh, the potential at the origin. That's a critical temperature, which is somewhat larger than this barrier temperature. And in fact, its value, the value of this field relative to the critical temperature, is given by uh, this ratio. And uh, <clears throat> here you see that this value uh, this ratio is um, big if lambda is small, and it becomes smaller and smaller when lambda uh, increases. So this is the structure of the model, and if you now got, get to the standard model, you have essentially the same, uh, just as a function, these coefficients A and B, they now depend on your cover couplings, the gauge couplings, and so on. Now, I should say, uh, calculating this potential uh, is not a completely trivial exercise. There was a lot of work done on that. And um, mostly in the mid-90s and a little bit later, which then now these days is used, you have to do loop corrections to get that. You have to discuss the gauge dependence, the infrared divergences. You have to worry of how you treat the Goldstone bosons. You have to do resumations. Then there are non-perturbative effects due to the non-abelian gauge interactions and so on. 
and there were lattice calculations done on that. So it's, uh, I would say, quite an interesting topic of uh, uh, field theory. And I think we have now uh, essentially a complete understanding of this phase transition. In the standard model, quantitatively and in extensions, most of, many of them also quantitatively and at least qualitatively. Now it turns out, we will see that later, that what you need for baryogenesis is uh, you need a phase transition where the jump of this, um, the jump of this field, the Higgs field, at the, this critical temperature here. This jump divided by the critical temperature is larger than one. That comes out of the study, and we'll see a little bit of that. But let me first show you what these calculations gave and what, in fact, the phase diagram of the electroweak theory is. This is done for <clears throat> SU2, and I think part of it also for SU2 cross U1, which is not a very big effect. The uh, first, what you see here is, in fact, these were calculations done some time ago, as you can see here. This Janssen summarized that. And they were done by lattice uh, calculations of the full uh, four-dimensional theory and lattice calculations in an effective three-dimensional theory. I mean, what is nice about these theories is the finite temperature field theory is one, as I said, where you have uh, in, in the time direction a finite interval. And you also have to have, for these bosonic fields, periodic boundary conditions. So effectively, what you have is a Kaluza-Klein theory, a Kaluza-Klein theory with one compact dimension. And for that, uh, what you can do is you can, if the temperature is big, that means the radius is small, you can integrate out uh, the Kaluza-Klein modes and go to an effective three-dimensional theory. That was a, a nice way of treating that, done by, at that time, the Helsinki group, Kayantje, uh, Homokain, Shaposhnikov, and Leine, and they got an effective three-dimensional theory, which they then simulated on the lattice. Of course, you have some errors in there which are not completely controllable. The other approach was that was mostly done by my lattice colleagues at DESI to uh, do a full four-dimensional simulation. And what you can see here, the stars, I think, are three-dimensional, the other things four-dimensional, and this line is, in fact, a resum perturbation theory. So all that works nicely together. And uh, now there were two problems with that. One is when all this work started, the Higgs mass <coughs> was known to be heavier, say, than 40 GeV. So everybody was hoping for, say, a light Higgs uh, to be found uh, soon, a lab, say, and uh, then um, one would have a nice, strong first order phase transition, and that was a big motivation for all this work. Then while this work was carried out, the bound on the Higgs mass increased and increased. And when the work was finished, it was clear that the Higgs was so heavy, I think at that time it was about here, that uh, this ratio V over T was too small so that it could work for baryogenesis. So a number of people just stopped to work on this. On the, end, on the other hand, what is interesting is that, that there is another effect, namely, uh, at some point, this perturbative calculation simply becomes wrong. And that is at about uh, here, at about 80 uh, GeV. And there it happens that this first order phase transition, which you have in the electroweak theory, becomes a crossover. It becomes a smooth transition. That that should happen, you can argue on general grounds. That it happens here, you can roughly understand uh, by in a, the following way. In a non abelian gauge theory at high temperature, you generate a non-perturbative mass for the vector boson, so-called magnetic mass. And if this magnetic mass becomes roughly equal to the mass which you generate by the vacuum expectation value of the X, these non-perturbative effects become important and the phase transition disappears. So here we now know that um, this is the lattice number. If the X mass is above 72 GeV, there simply is no phase transition at all in the standard model. Nevertheless, uh, the work on biogenesis, electronic biogenesis, continued. And of course, you can still have um, 
uh, first order phase transition if you go to extensions. So you may think of a two x doublet model as maybe the simplest version. You can add a singlet, you can go to supersymmetry at that time, all viable possibilities, and you can again uh, find a first order phase transition. So then uh, you have to calculate for this first order phase transition, first you have to calculate uh, the rate uh, at which uh, these bubbles form, the so-called nucleation rate which is given here by such, in such a semi-classical approximation. It's given by a field configuration which interpolates between the two vacua, the broken and the uh, symmetric phase. And then you can calculate that and see how these bubbles form and expand. And now you get uh, this picture from electronic baryogenesis. You have, say, one big bubble. Let's look at one big bubble which expands very fast um, with a velocity of about, uh, say, 0 0.1, 0 0.01 times the sound velocity, which I think is about one-third of the velocity of light in this relativistic plasma. <clears throat> and then as it expands, uh, the particles in the plasma uh, interact with this bubble wall, which you have here at the boundary. So inside you have the true vacuum, the Higgs phase, where um, the broken phase where this wave is different from zero and where this Fahlerhorn rate is zero, essentially. So no conversion anymore between um, particles, between baryons and leptons. But you have also reflections. And here outside the symmetric phase where the Higgs wave is zero and um, where the Fahlerhorn uh, processes are active. <coughs> now, <coughs> it, it's sufficient uh, to do this calculation in the end, essentially for a one-dimensional system, where you say you take the bubble wall as a plane, which just uh, propagates, and you study a transmission and reflection at this wall. And now what is important, how the fermions behave interacting with this wall. So this is, say, a typical Yukawa coupling. You have the Yukawa coupling, you have the Higgs field, right and left-handed uh, fermion. And the bubble wall, you can imagine as, say, uh, something here which interpolates between um, a value different from zero, the real part different from zero, and zero outside. And then what is important, you also have a phase which varies. And, uh, well, now you have to calculate the baryon asymmetry. And that's uh, really, calculating this baryon asymmetry is a difficult problem. I think to really develop uh, how that works maybe took uh, roughly 10 years so that people agree now on the details. It's really very difficult. You can, in principle, you can start from a rigorous formalism, which is a schwinger keldish formalism for treating non-equilibrium processes in quantum field theory. From that, you can go uh, via some approximations to Boltzmann equations. Still too complicated. You can make further approximations go to diffusion equations, which I think well motivated. And uh, then you have these diffusion equations with this moving wall. And uh, <clears throat> now, what now happens is if you look at the situation, say, in the rest frame of this wall, which moves, then in the rest frame, you get a stationary solution, a stationary configuration. So that means these chemical potential, which describe uh, the asymmetry uh, between particles and antiparticles, depend just on now one coordinate in this approximation, namely the distance from the wall. And what we are interested in is um, we are interested in the chemical potentials of all the left-handed uh, quarks. Because the left-handed quarks, say in particular the left-handed top quarks that has the biggest interaction with this um, wall, this uh, left-handed um, <coughs> top, top quark, uh, that's, or these left-handed quarks, those are the ones which then in these follow-on processes uh, where an asymmetry which you generate in these numbers uh, is transmitted 
uh, turned into a baryon, as a lepton and baryon asymmetry. So therefore, we are interested in this. And then you can convince yourself that now, once you have this uh, profile of chemical potentials in front of the wall, that then the change in baryon number per time is this follow-on rate. And then you have here this left-handed chemical potential. And then you have to subtract a term which is converted away by means of this follow-on transition, which is proportional to the asymmetry which you have. So imagine uh, you start from zero, then you just have a source term which comes from this interaction with the bubble wall. That gives you, say, an excess in uh, left-handed uh, quarks over right-handed anti-quarks. And then, <clears throat> uh, but once you have that, then the follow-on processes are active and convert part of that into a baryon asymmetry, just uh, the left of left-handed particles. And uh, uh, then you have to, so this gives you the rate of change of this. And then you have to integrate that to get the final result. Now, uh, but the question, of course, is how do you calculate these objects? And that is, in fact, then these diffusion equations. You have to look at all the particle species. And you get, uh, well, really second order differential equations, but to a good approximation, first order different equations, differential equations for these chemical potentials. Where you have the first derivative, this is the wall velocity. Then you they couple to the other chemical potentials. And here you have a source term. So that you can derive. That's a long literature on how you do that, which I cannot discuss here. And actually, even if I had more time, I would not be able to, because uh, these details are really for those people who work on that. And, uh, but once you have that, that's what people then solve. And in the end, they calculate from this the baryon asymmetry. And you see, then you go back. What then enters here, you have to go back to the frame where the wall moves. And um, so uh, the bearing asymmetry, which you generate, depends on the wall velocity. These are the chemical potentials, which you integrate over all the space, say, on one side of the bubble. And what appears in the exponent is, again, this Fahlerhorn rate. And uh, <clears throat> this is a coefficient which you have to calculate. And the wall velocity, again, appears. So this is just to show you what, in principle, people do who uh, calculate in this way the baryon asymmetry. Yeah. Sorry? Well, the CP, I will come to the CP asymmetry now in certain models. But the CP, how the CP asymmetry comes in, of course, is model dependent. I mean, the simplest example which I have is uh, now, the two x doublet model that will be on the next slide, there you have a CP phase among, uh, in the couplings of the Higgs, uh, the two Higgs fields. And this, via a loop effect, couples to the uh, CP asymmetry, which uh, in the end makes this phase change. So it's a complicated process. Uh, well, the CP phase is in here in the source term. I mean, this source term is essentially, if you work this out, the source term uh, you get from the interaction um, <clears throat> of these fermions with a bubble wall. This is a bubble wall, and uh, there is a phase. And this phase, you have to calculate how this phase uh, is of this bubble wall is then related to the, say, the phases which you introduce in your tree level Lagrangian. OK? And uh, yeah, how to do that is again, uh, no, but of course, in principle, you are right. This phase is crucial. Without the phase, there would be no asymmetry. Now, we know in the standard model it doesn't work. So let's go to the next. Uh, uh, possibility, two Higgs doublets, which has been studied in much detail. So you have two Higgs fields here, H1, H2. And uh, <clears throat> you see here the phase uh, appears just here. 
In fact, it's, uh, it appears together with a mass term. And uh, apart from this term, in fact, the model has a certain symmetry, a Z2 symmetry, um, where H1 goes to minus H1 and H2 uh, does not change, which forbids such mixed terms. So this Z2 symmetry is broken. Now, why you use this Lagrangian is a long story. And uh, you have to worry also about flame changing processes and uh, the CP violation, which you generate from that, and so on. <clears throat> Now, of course, uh, I cannot go through the analysis in detail of such a model because altogether it's rather complicated. I just put here one quantity which also work on that introduce because what is important for the consistency is also how big are the couplings, the Yukawa couplings which you have here. And one measure is that you say how big is, say, the one loop correction to such a coupling and you uh, divide it to its tree level value to see whether, say, the perturbative uh, treatment is at all correct. I come back to this number. Now, uh, <clears throat> and I would like to give you, uh, say, of two rather recent papers, in fact, this last one, very recent, just some uh, numbers. The, uh, the first is, in fact, this one. This is, came out of a detailed study of these people already a couple of years ago but it's a thorough uh, treatment. And what is plotted here is the Higgs mass. At that time, we didn't know where it was. Now we know it's here, 125. And this is the second, the mass of the second neutral Higgs, how heavy it is. And when it gets heavier, uh, that means that your cover couplings, which you have in your Lagrangian, become bigger. And <clears throat> then, uh, these are lines, say, in this parameter space, which give you a certain barrier asymmetry, which is here in units of 10 to the minus 11. Now, we know <clears throat> the barrier asymmetry is now 6 times 10 to the minus 10, so we have to go along this line. Or we have to be about here. Now, this is the ratio of uh, this jump in the x parameter over t. This is 1. And going up here, it also means it has to go to 1.52. They did not put this number here, but I think it's roughly 1.5, which you need up here. So it shows you, if you choose appropriate parameters, you can make it. Uh, you can uh, get 426. You can choose, say, a coupling lambda, such that this Higgs mass is so big, which gives you the right by an asymmetry. <clears throat> but you are that close to the region where the model is strongly coupled because this quantity delta is already 0.5. So you need, essentially, in such a model, you need big couplings to make this work. This is interesting because the same couplings and the same CP violation which you need in biogenesis, they also uh, affect dipole moments. And the dipole moments which you get of these, here, uh, of these models are very close to the current experimental bound. As far as I know, it's still consistent, but uh, yeah, it's close. Now, uh, these people had more recently uh, a detailed studies in view of LHC. They did not study the full uh, biogenesis, but the strength of the phase transition, and then I think it's plausible that biogenesis will work. And uh, so what they get is that, uh, you know, the A0, uh, the pseudoscalar mass, in the 2x doublet model should be larger than 400 GeV in that case, and the second neutral Higgs and the charged Higgses should be lighter in mass. So you get a definite mass hierarchy, which is important because, of course, the charged Higgses may be more easily observable. And also via a loop, they modify um, the um, uh, branching ratio of uh, the Higgs we have the neutral Higgs to two photons. And you can get uh, corrections five, even up to 10%. So that's, so what from that you see is if such a picture would be correct, it's very important to look for charged uh, Higgses and to have precision measurements of uh, the uh, uh, Higgs uh, branching ratios. Now, uh, I think two months ago, this paper came out. 
and they uh, look at uh, the electrode phase transition, see whether they can get a strong phase transition uh, in a particular version of the 2x doublet model where, uh, in fact, one of the Higgs's does not couple to fermions but uh, is, in fact, stable and can give dark matter. So they uh, present three examples, and it's just instructive to look at that. So, for instance, uh, if uh, the pseudoscalar mass here, that is roughly around 300, 400 GeV. The charged Higgs mass is 300, 400, like this. So it's pretty much consistent with this. So you expect charged Higgs bosons really to see at the LHC. Then uh, <clears throat> the one which gives the dark matter can be pretty light. Could be 200, heavier than the Higgs, but it could be as small as 5 GV. And what is interesting is you predict sizable deviations due to uh, these charged Higgses uh, in the branching ratio of uh, Higgs to, um, to gammas. So if this picture, so you have, I think what is nice about this is these groups push the 2x doublet model to a level where one can hope uh, to really either see an effect or uh, to falsify it now at the LHC. <clears throat> and that is related to this rather light charged Higgses. Either you can see them directly or uh, via the loop effect, they significantly modify uh, the rate of Higgs to gamma gamma. Now, this brings me to the second example, which where the motivation is different. That's motivated uh, by uh, composite Higgs models. You heard about uh, uh, just in the previous lecture. And uh, so the idea here is that you have a Higgs sector with a composite scale of about a TV. And then you may have uh, an additional singlet in addition to uh, the Higgs doublet. And then you can design uh, a Lagrangian, uh, which uh, gives you first order phase transition. Where now what is important, this first order phase transition is not caused by thermal corrections, but uh, the first order phase transition is due to the tree level potential, the interaction between uh, this singlet and the Higgs doublet. This is the neutral part, H, little h, of the Higgs double, and S is a singlet. And here you see the temperature behavior, which in fact affects both uh, H and uh, the, uh, the singlet. And I think the coefficients are such that in fact first uh, S develops a VEF, the singlet, and then H. Both fields develop a vacuum expectation value. And here two examples are given that were work was done before uh, the X was uh, discovered. So now what is relevant for us is 120 GV. And then <clears throat> you see that you have a rather light singlet here of 80 GV. This is a critical jump in the X wave. And uh, this is uh, the wall uh, thickness. I will come to that. And sorry, this is and this is uh, this quantity divided by the critical temperature. So you have a light singlet, lighter than the Higgs, which is, I think, very interesting. That is needed for the phase transition. On the other hand, such a particle, even if it's a light, to see it is difficult because it just couples to the Higgs. So how to figure that out and what limits can be set from LHC on that I think uh, is a very interesting question, and as far as I know, it has not really been worked out in detail. So to look at such models and to really work out seriously, I think uh, the LHC implications, in my opinion, is uh, an important problem. Now coming again to CP violation. Now CP violation in this model, <clears throat> you cannot get from the renormalizable Lagrangian, but uh, that means from these terms here, but you have to introduce a dimension five operator uh, in this model, which you can argue you have because uh, it's a composite uh, theory. So what you need is a coupling for the top, right-handed top, left-handed top doublet. This is a Higgs and this is a singlet. And this uh, coupling 
by a two loop generates a dipole moment for the electron, which maybe looks quite surprising. But you have this big coupling here. Here via this, the S uh, couples uh, to the top. And <clears throat> then you have the photon, here you have the photon, and this. And also for the neutron, you get a dipole moment. And again, these dipole moments are close to the current experimental limits. So it's interesting and at the same time dangerous. In that respect, the situation is similar as in the 2x doublet model. And the scale here, which appears here in front of this thing, is uh, about a TV. OK, now note, uh, just one note. I did not discuss the MSSM. I mean, there, were, there was a huge investigation on the MSSM, baryogenesis in the MSSM. But um, that requires that, first of all, that quarks are very heavy, which is OK, but that the stop then is lighter than the top. That, uh, I don't know whether one can still defend that possibility sort of as a case where the stop is essentially degenerate with the stop. The stop is essentially mass degenerate with the top. It cannot be distinguished. But in any case, I think it's very special. So I will not uh, discuss it uh, further. So finally, I think I should come close to an end. Eh? But let me uh, do, a, as a summary, <clears throat> now the following. I think uh, electronic biogenesis is a very interesting topic in non-equilibrium quantum field theory. And there's been a huge activity on this field for the last, on this one number, for the last uh, 30 years. And I think the interest in this is due to the fact that it's so closely related to electronic symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism. So I think it's very important now to really uh, make progress on this issue uh, at the LHC. Now, what I did here, finally, is uh, I asked one of the experts working on this, uh, because reading these papers is sometimes not so easy. And I wanted uh, to understand where do the orders, I mean, is there a simple formula? Is there something simple so that you can see where the orders of magnitude come from? finally, in the baryon symmetry. And apparently, what you get out of these diffusion equations and so on, you can roughly parameterize like this. You have the Sphaleron rate, the baryon symmetry here normalized to the entropy density, is uh, the Sphaleron rate divided by t to the fourth, which is about uh, 10 to the minus 6 here, as we know. Then you have uh, the wall thickness. Uh, the wall thickness and the variation of this phase over the thickness gives you the source terms in the diffusion equations, <clears throat> and that is roughly, say, 0.1. Then you have some CP violating phase, and say, in the renormalizable models, uh, you get uh, via loop effects induced uh, CP violation in the top um, bubble wall. Uh, interaction, so you get a loop factor 1 over 4 pi. So this is a gain effect about 0.1. This is a fact of possible Boltzmann suppression if the uh, particle is a little bit heavy, uh, which does the reflections uh, on this wall. Let me put that to 1. Then one has a, a power which comes out of solving the diffusion equations of this critical wave over uh, the critical temperature, which is between 3 and 4. And then in these diffusion equations, there is some uncertainty or something which gives you another factor between 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the minus 2. So this chain of factors with ambiguities, of course, shows you, reflects the complication of this whole calculation. If you are now on the optimistic side and take everywhere the best numbers, you get, uh, say, something like 10 to the minus 9. And we know you have to get 6 times 10 to the minus 10. Now, as you see, it's possible. But from what we uh, learned, strong interactions in the couplings and new particles appear to be unavoidable. So for the 2x doublet models, you need charged six bosons. You may have a light singlet. You have new interactions. So uh, you really. Uh, need to see something at uh, the LHC. So dedicated searches at the LHC, stronger bounds on the dipole moments, and electroweak precision tests 
should really be able, I hope, in the next couple of years, maybe to bring this topic of electroweak biogenesis to some end, positive or negative, we'll see. So, and that, I think, is a maybe good point to stop for today. Sorry, in the page that you uh, had the example for the standard model extension with a singlet, yes. can you please bring this to page? This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wonder how to uh, determine the VC. It, it should be a function of T C itself, right? Uh, I mean, the, I did not give the impression, the expression here, but of course, uh, the VC is a function of the parameters here, which you have uh, in the Lagrangian. Yes, but uh, how we I can mean, this, this TC, compute first it of all, here. is a function of the parameters, and then also uh, say say this ratio is a function of the parameters. I did not give all these. Uh, yeah, how, actually, I need to know what is the functionality. What's the relation of uh, I mean VC with TC? It should be a function of TC itself, right? Well, and then <coughs> I. Uh, <coughs> I have the paper in my room. I can bring it tomorrow okay. and we can compare. Okay, so. Remember you were saying that the CP assumed ratios have been the source of the left-handed chemical potential? Uh, yeah, I mean. But also, you said that the SU3 spholerons don't play a role. Excuse but I, I guess that the SU3 spholerons will... Oh, they... They, they, uh, they will dilute that yeah. left-handed no, the, the, right? the SU, What the SU3 spholerons do is, um, if you look at... Um, if you look at these, these mu eyes, right. these are chemical potential for all the particles. So you get a system of diffusion equations, and then uh, the SU3 spholerons give you some relations between them. It's right. like in this... Uh, the problem gets just harder. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you... Um, well, I wouldn't... Say, well, uh, no, I think it's somehow nice to have them, the SU3 spholerons, because it reduces... I mean, you can safely, I think, assume that they are in thermal equilibrium. And therefore, that gives you directly some relations between chemical potentials, so it just reduces the number of degrees of freedom. Right, but it also dilutes the left-handed. I guess that it reduces yeah. the left-handed chemical yes. potential to the right-handed guy. So yes, it makes it reduces. Right. I think that you see here uh, in this um, formula, which I here uh, gave here to estimate the effect. I said diffusion is a factor ten to the minus. Oh, oh I see. So I think okay. it's in there. I mean, if you look at these equations, they contain thermal averages of various quantities, and then um, that uh, relates uh, the relations which due to that that contains relations which uh, uh, yeah. due to these SU3 phylons you have between different chemical potentials. I'm curious about the next slide. Yeah. Um, no, uh, this plot with the predictions of the the mass of the yes, it is. Yeah. How can it be so predictive, uh, even with uh, too much uh, parameters? Yeah. Free parameters. That's a good question that I also ask myself. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Personally, I've been working on the phase transition in the past, but I never worked on that. Now, um, how it can be so predictive is um, uh, if you look at this paper, this is a rather, no, no, it, it is a, I looked at it, it's a, a really a rather careful study, and then uh, the question is which uh, couplings in the end are most important. So, for instance, if you, you have uh, <clears throat> these masses here, 
are functions of the Yukawa couplings in the theory. And now some of these couplings, in the end, for uh, generating the asymmetry are more important than others. And in fact, in order to make the phase transition strongly first order, you are typically driven into certain parameter regions where uh, you know, certain couplings play the dominant role. And in fact, these couplings then usually are typically pretty big. That's why I, I listed this number here. Which, is, which gives you the change in coupling as you go from uh, here from three level to the one loop correction. So for the whole thing to work at all, you are driven to uh, uh, force to go to a regime where some couplings are large. And I guess then, um, of course, uh, they <coughs> clearly you have a parameter space, I think of all together, maybe five parameters. So you can say, how can I get just a line in this plane? Okay. Now clearly, uh, that means that you have fixed the other parameters. How they are fixed is given in the paper, and I think, I expect that that is uh, reasonable. But that I'm not, I was not able to check. In that manner, uh, for the case of the singlet, Yes. Uh, they made this prediction also. Yes. Now, for the singlet, <clears throat> the situation is more transparent because, as you see, you have less parameters. And uh, the, the other difference is in the 2x doublet model, you have to make the phase transition first order. That means to generate the, this bump, uh, this barrier, and the potential from radiative corrections. That's difficult, and therefore you go to these large uh, parameters. Here, you get this first order phase transition from a three level coupling. So I think that is essentially, in fact, these authors, they, if you are interested in that, these papers are uh, quite good to read, actually. So I hope I, I, it seems I forgot to uh, list the authors here on the slide. I, I don't, in the other case, I think I gave the others here. I forgot. I mean, th these are papers by this group, Espinoza, Constantine, uh, and two other, Riva. And, uh, no, no, but, but these papers, if you're interested, I give you the reference. Or I, maybe I put it even back on the slide tomorrow, tonight. And uh, these papers are quite well uh, to read. And uh, there, uh, you can understand how it happens, how you make the phase transition sufficiently strong first order. And then, <clears throat> uh, so I think that is safe, and you don't need much extreme parameters for that. But then, in order to get the right CP violation, you just introduce by hand another term. Thank you. I still not, I am still not convinced about the role of spherons in QCD. Isn't, QCD, yeah. Isn't it true that uh, this spheron only exists because of some kind of anomaly and the QCD is a vector theory, or am, am I mistaken in this? No, that's right. I mean, of course, the uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, say the instantons in QCD uh, are relevant for the axial anomaly there. So there is no spheroidal problem. In, I mean, there is no effect in QCD, right? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, um, pe people believe that um, <coughs> the instanton effects uh, are there in QCD. In fact, in the old days, uh, I mean, the early days of QCD, people even tried to calculate chiral symmetry breaking, which you have in QCD, as an effect due to instantons. So I think there is no doubt among those people who do, say, lattice simulations for QCD, that these uh, field configurations, which have topological charge, uh, are there and play an important role. I think this is not... Uh, Debated. Now, it's another question how to see directly their effect. Because uh, they, the same way, here the spherons or the SU2 instantons 
change, can change barrier number, these uh, instant on the QCD change chirality. And there were recently some interesting papers, I think uh, by <clears throat> at Brookhaven, by Shoyak and collaborators, where they were looking for ways maybe to see such chirality changes in heavy iron collisions. Must be difficult, but was discussed. Thank you. No more questions? Okay, let's thank with again.